Hey everybody, I'm Agree. I'm Harrison. This is Bottom Line Design. And on today's episode, we have a guest who we are very excited about. Uh, months in the making, you know, getting getting everybody in the room here. Uh, we've got Rid, who most recently was the founding designer of Maven. Um, so Rid, if you want to just like go ahead and, you know, give give the, the crowd a quick intro on yourself. I feel like you're inescapable on design Twitter these days. Oh, no. And this is the first time I've ever been described as inescapable. So I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what to do with that one, but way. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've spent the last few years in the deep end of education, working as founding designer of Maven. Uh, I've also created my own course, Figma Academy, which I'm still working on. I've actually been able to move that to Maven recently. And I've started podcasting. So I have a new podcast called Deep Dives. And that is plenty enough to keep me busy right now. Incredible. Nice. So I would love to hear your start from, uh, where was it? You were a server at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> so didn't you go from like an associate at like a, uh, like a financial firm and then a server and then a financial firm and then you went to Shinesty where you were like working on their brand identity? Yeah. Was that just like a moment of like self-discovery? So it, it was, I mean, it was all, you're basically describing college, right? So I was an economics major and mm. loved macroeconomics, international trade. I wanted to work on Wall Street and sling derivatives all day. And I'm sitting in the library at my university, DePaul University, and I'm reading this blog and it's describing the day in the life of a person that walks on Wall Street, like that's trying to climb the, climb the ladder. And it was hell. Like it was quite clear that these associates lived through hell for at least two years. And I decided right then, I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And so I was trying to find, well, what is closely related? And I found venture capital. I didn't really know what venture capital was, but I went after this internship and got it. And so I showed up in my like suit and my... <laughs> Like, you know, my fancy loafers looking all spiffy for day one. Why you in a suit and loafers? Ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. right? I haven't worn a collared shirt in years. And, and but like I was that, there. Like, as a, the VC intern, I, I can only imagine. They must have been like, this is incredible. Like, <laughs> so here's the kicker, though, is I showed up and I walk into the VC and they tell me, oh, actually, your internship is the floor below at the tech <laughs> accelerator. Oh. And so I walk down the oh. stairs in my suit and my loafers and <laughs> it's just a bunch of people hacking in sweatpants. And I'm like, what is this? And within one week I knew like, okay, this is, this is dope. This is what I want to do forever. Totally got bit by the bug. That was actually what really pushed me into design. And so the, the Buffalo Wild Wings was actually like, so that's a summer internship. Buffalo yeah. Wild Wings was then what I did in the fall just to pay tuition and make money. And then right. by the time I had finished that internship over the course of the summer, I was getting really into startups, really into design. And I, my friend had this e-commerce business that he was starting. And he's like, you know, come over, work with me. You can spend this semester learning how to code and I'll teach you the business side of what it's like to like, you know, spin up a startup from nothing. And so I joined as like an intern for his e-commerce company and he ended up raising multiple venture rounds and is you know, still doing it to this day. So it was kind of like a fun experience that makes no sense when you look at it on just like a pure resume, but it was my rendezvous into tech and design. Did you feel, um, did you feel like any like guilt by, you know, I mean, how did your parents feel about this pivot? My parents were totally fine until, so I basically stopped going to class. I, I totally stopped going to class and I was just <laughs> learning <laughs> Illustrator. Like I was seriously spending all day in Adobe Illustrator, just making things. And that was fine until I got an email, which was CC'd my parents on it. And it was, Hey, Michael's not going to be able to graduate because we're removing him from this class because he doesn't attend anymore. And there must've been some miscommunication because he's not actually in this class. I was in this class. I just <laughs> hadn't been going to the class. And so that was when it kind of was 
put on their radar a little bit where you're like, hey, maybe all this money that we're spending towards college isn't the best investment into his career. So it was kind of a long sales cycle. I ended up having to basically get an A on this test or not be able to graduate, which was enough fire that got me to open up an economics textbook again. Um, mostly, mostly they were fine with it though. Good. Nice support of parents. Wow. Wait, so, so were you like, did you have a visual background or like, were you like a creative artistic type before you found these, uh, these folks hacking away in sweatpants, the floor below the VC's office? The day that you were in the suit and loafers. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I really had a visual or artistic background. Like music, for sure. Like I have a big music background. But I didn't draw. I can I can still to this day, like I don't sketch anything. Like it's like a humiliating experience for me to put pen to paper. I just don't do it. So I, I actually tried to learn how to code first. Like that was my initial motivation was like, I don't want to be the idea guy. I want to be able to contribute meaningfully to product. And if I'm going to work in tech startups, that is something that I care about. I just sucked my first time trying to learn how to code. It made no sense. It was so confusing. And so I was like, okay, well, what about design? <laughs> and right. I ended up really liking that. And so I kind of went, you know, five, six years where I was like designing everything, working for my own startup at, at eventually. Um, but I wouldn't have necessarily called myself a designer. It was more like I'm a founder product person who designs. What do you, what do you think that, that motivation to want to contribute versus, yeah, like this idea path came from? I think that I can, I can trace it back to this moment actually it was in my parents house and i don't know if you ever played the game draw something on ios where you'd draw a picture and you send it to your friend and they would have to guess what it is and you'd have this back and forth oh yeah yeah, yeah i remember yeah. playing that game it was so fun and i was like man the idea of this game is so ridiculously simple but what makes it magical is just how fun it was and it like felt wonderful to use this app and have this back and forth with your friends but it was also so simple and i think it was like really motivating for me because i saw this app and i was like man i can do this like i could totally make something like this yeah i don't know i have that i have a very specific moment then where it it was partly out of necessity partly because i knew i would just have to pay for it if i couldn't do it myself but also because I thought that I could do it too. Like I did have some level of confidence that I could figure it out. And by that point, like that, when you had that like aha moment that I could build one of these things, right? Uh, was this, this was after you uh, had done that summer internship? This would have been that summer, actually. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So it was like very much like in the air. Right. Yeah, like you were very much so going to these like, you know, this like startup accelerator space, but then also like you're seeing these products yourself, right? Like using them. Totally. Totally. It wow. was, I mean, it, it totally put me on a completely different trajectory. And when is it that you first felt comfortable calling oh. yourself a designer rather than a founder who happens to design? It took a while. So for context, the year that we're describing right now, Oh man, I might mess this up. It would have been like 2012 or 2013 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I graduated, I had this decision was basically, do I join this tech startups that I was working for at the time, my senior year of college, I spent working for this tech startup and I was going to move out to Silicon Valley and work for them. Or do I do my own thing? And I decided to do my own thing. And I basically jumped into the Shopify ecosystem. I started just like making MVP commerce apps essentially and just practicing everything and making every mistake in the book. And so the first product that I designed from scratch would have been like 2014 or something like that. And um, I did that for five years. Yeah, 
five years where I was designing all kinds of stuff. Like we launched multiple products, one actual like startup where we, we went and raised money and had this multi-platform uh, product. And so that was kind of trial by fire as a designer, but I still wouldn't have called myself a designer because I'm doing all of the sales and all of the marketing and all of the support, raising money. And after that startup inevitably went to zero, I was kind of sitting in the rubble a little bit, trying to mm -hmm. figure out like, okay, what the heck do I do? Like I just got married. All of a sudden it felt very real. Like I need to make money fast. And I was kind of evaluating all my options. I was like, you know what? The part that I enjoyed the most was definitely the design. Let's just try it. And so every single day for, gosh, almost a year, I went on to Dribble's job board and the for hire subreddit. And I just pitched myself to startup specifically, just left and right, as many different products as I could possibly design, as many websites as I could make. At that time, I was pretty proficient in web flow. So I was spinning up web flow sites and I just designed like a madman for a year. And still, I don't know if I would call myself a designer. Like I still, I don't know, it was weird. Like I was just hustling. I felt I identified more with just being a hustler than a designer until I decided, okay, it's time for a little bit more stability. And I then officially started applying for design roles for the first time. And I had been designing like at least seven years, almost every day. And I had never actually applied and I had never actually had a resume where I pitched myself as, as a designer. So at that point, that's when I would have embraced the title of designer, probably not until I got my first W2 role as a designer. Right, right. Like an offer letter that's like, you are a designer to us. Yeah. Like, Whoa, no way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I found out like six months into the role that technically my title was senior product designer. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm already a senior. <laughs> <laughs> so you just like leap on straight into Yeah, it, I changed right? my LinkedIn there's, that day. <laughs> there's this really funny like shit meme that was uh, saying like, think you have imposter syndrome? Think again. Are you even good enough to have imposter syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's wild. Okay. So, so basically you had been designing every day for seven years before you felt comfortable calling yourself a designer. Yeah. Was there any time where, uh, you were, I'm sure during that seven years you were working with other designers. Did you ever feel like, oh shit, they're going to call me out on something? I, the crazy thing is like, I really wasn't like, I, I seriously did not work with other designers. I was the only designer for my startup. Every time I'm working with other companies, I'm just doing all the design. I hadn't, didn't even know how to collaborate with other designers. I hadn't been in a crit for seven years, like not even one. I had done everything. I had worn every single hat in every single instance of me being a designer. So what I can now see looking back is that my skill chart was like really wacky because I had no formal training whatsoever, <laughs> but I had done a lot. And by this point, I'm even, I, I had even joined a coding bootcamp. And so I had a lot of like front end savvy. I was, I was pretty good at Webflow. Like I really got how front ends worked, but nobody had ever taught me the basics of typography, like ever. I don't know if I had ever adjusted a line height in my life and I had been designing for seven years. <laughs> and so you don't even know, like you just don't know what you don't know. I remember when I was applying for a job, this company actually was user interviews. I don't know if you've ever seen their product mm -hmm. and yeah, so I'm applying, I get to the final stages and I think this is literally the first company that I've ever actually went through the application process for. And they're like asking me to present my work and talk about it. And the guy is just like, so why is everything five and 10 pixels spaced apart? Like, why aren't you using like an eight point grid? And I was like, what, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Seven years, seven years. And I had, I had never even considered the fact that like, hey, I just randomly picked these numbers five and 10 and they might not make sense. So it was just a little lopsided you know in terms funny? of what I was capable of. Right. You know what's funny is though, is like 
the way that you're talking, uh, the way that you uh, eventually arrive down this path, like seven years, uh, like finally being able to call yourself a designer, it actually puts an emphasis on what's most important during a startup's journey uh, when thinking about design. It sounds like you brought a lot more design thinking than actual IC work. Like, was there were there moments where you thought that, um, y- like, w- one was one was more important than the other, or like, did you always feel that like that IC work was more important that that you couldn't actually express it in the way that you wanted to, so you just took on all these other roles? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, my brain kind of goes two places. One is I really can't emphasize enough the fact that I didn't know where my gaps were because I hadn't Mm. been around a lot of designers. And so I probably looked at my work and I was like, that's fine as hell. And now I would look at it and be like, are you like, I don't understand the basics of, you know, layout or typography. I'd never even considered what it would be like to use a grid, but I knew my work was like moving the needle. And so I do think that I, understood my ability to contribute at like higher level product strategy and really, I don't say influence the roadmap, but like you have to understand that up until this point, I'm basically a single designer working with the founder. I was the roadmap, you know, like it, it was whatever we were going to make together. I remember working with, um, okay, actually I do have one moment where I started to realize how much higher the visual ceiling was and like the craft ceiling. There's a company called Otis and it's founded by this guy named Michael, who I think was the founder of Skillshare actually. And he hired me as a basically just like this little side project person where I'm just going to explore a bunch of ideas with the app, just with him. And I was just going to be like his partner. And I remember it was my first time using Figma and I thought that I brought a lot of really great ideas to the table in my biased opinion. But then I looked at the other designer and I don't, I, to this day, I don't even know who it was. And I looked at the other designers Figma file and that's where I was like, oh my gosh, this is a level of craft that I just haven't seen in a Figma file before. And there's so much more. Like it was this moment where I was like, okay, there is so much more if I want to be truly good at this. And yeah. it's not going to be enough to just be able to like wear my founder hat and make things look visually appealing. But like, if I want to get really excellent at the craft that I actually do have a lot to grow in. Okay. There's like so much in there that you literally just outlined in speech, an entire rock climbing wall of toeholds that I'm like, <laughs> where do I even start <laughs> with like, like first question? Like the, the first one I have is like something I've thought about for well over a decade now. Like the, what you're bringing up of like, okay, you're self-taught, right? And um, I think of people who self-teach in any discipline as almost taking like a scientific approach to the craft totally, because you just ha- have these experiences that you've built up and then over time they will bubble up into something cohesive like you know a set of theories that you have and and things that you've noticed not from any classroom you were in but from just like all the different startups you tried all the different products that you ship things that they have in common right so like at the same time though you identified this other problem which is that like the scientific approach to like uh learning or that like that self teaching it's inhibited because you don't know what you don't know, you know? And I'm, I'm curious to hear, like, Rid, you're now in the design education space, right? You're, I would love to hear if, like, you know, a lot of what you're doing now is not, like, almost speaking to your past self today, right? Like, the, the 50 other Rids that are out there that, you know, are self-learning. But, like, if you had to do it over again, is there something you would do differently to, like, learn the the high highs or the ceilings of that craft as you were like kind of in single player mode yes <laughs> resounding yes <laughs> first off just to like underline something you said i do think that people that are self-learners grab on to more scientific 
approaches to learning because it's it's easier to follow a model in some ways. And so I look at yeah. the, a lot of the ways that I approach visual design now are essentially just a bundle of rules of thumb that I've just kind of found totally. and thrown into my bag over the years. And now I have enough of them where it's like, yeah, I can spin up a full visual system for a product with no second guessing myself at any point because I have a model. And it took me too freaking long to learn that model, man. Like it took me too long. I would have started there and I don't know. I, you got to be careful because you can put me in rant mode pretty quickly on this. But like, I do think that a lot of designers, I think we do it backwards a little bit where so many people, and there's nothing against like the Google UX certificate. I think it's amazing what they're doing. They put a lot of man hours into that, but I can't recite a single UX theory. I've never been able to, not even one. And I don't think it matters <laughs> because it's like so much of UX is just exposing yourself to more and more problems and finding all of these shared patterns yeah. across different products and different ways of solving like that same problem with just a subtle tweak, but it's still kind of the same problem. And so I think unfortunately that there's not like this silver bullet article or website that you can discover that's gonna be like, wow, I get UX now. It's like, that's, it's just UX is tied to reps and this intuition that comes with just solving a bunch of problems and exposing yourself to different types of products and problem spaces even. But man, visual design is visual design. Like you can learn visual design and there's nothing stopping you. And actually there are pretty good resources out there where you can go in one year, if you really want to go for it, you can become a visually excellent designer enough to check that box for like years of roles. And then you can figure out the, the UX stuff as you like get into the space and start working around other designers and assimilate into a team and work on your first project. Like I would totally go back and I don't know if I'd find some kind of like a UX core or a UI like course or, or visual design you know, boot camp or whatever. I love shift nudge as a example. Like, man, if I would have done shift nudge day one of being a designer, I think that I would have grown so much more quickly. And yeah, cause I don't think I learned that for like six or seven years and it really held me back. Wow. It's funny because, um, when I think about visual design, like UI, that whole, that whole world, I think about what, at least like what influenced me when I was growing up was just going to a bunch of museums and like, uh, growing up, I always had like a ton of like, uh, coffee table books that were just like massive and just like big photographies of like landscapes or pieces of art. And so I think you're, I think you're mostly right when you say like visual design could probably be taught. But I think there's also this component of just like lived experiencing li lived experiences, making taste, like making like this internal like taste meter. And I definitely agree with you when you say that uh, if people had started off with that, because yeah, UX is just all about like, it's like a uh, rules based law. <laughs> Like th this, this can go here or like hierarchy or like uh, UX, uh, like information architecture. It's just like, okay, this is a law. This is a law. This is a law. But it is also just uh, how many experiences can you throw yourself into? And it reminds me a lot of when I was at RISD, I did not uh, study UI and UX. Actually, like a lot of professors um, really didn't un understand what I want to do or why I want to do it. But UI and UX is basically just the digital format of product design, industrial mm -hmm. design, like actual product, design, like physical nature product design. And what I remember doing is just um, going out to a bunch of these companies that I really admired and then redesigning their site because they wouldn't respond to me over email. And so uh, one of them was Imager. And I just uploaded it and became like the top voted image. And so Alan gave me a call back. But that story, I tell that story as much as I can to young designers because they all want to pay for these classes. They all want to like get into these boot camps. And sure, like maybe some of them are cool, but I haven't come across one and I certainly have not ever recommended it. Do you yeah. think that, do you think that, um, 
looking back at it now, you would have you would have uh, explored different disciplines outside of UI and UX or like visual, yeah, like visual UI UX design within the design discipline itself. I actually don't think I would have. And I think I used to be somewhat self-conscious about that a little bit because I always looked back and I kind of would wonder like, do I have taste? Is there some artist hidden down here? Like I don't have a swipe file of all of the chairs that I thought were beautiful over the years. You know, like I have nothing like yeah. that. Like I, I learned design because I wanted to build a billion dollar company. <laughs> you know, it was very, it was very business driven, at least in the early stages. And I even look at my own like swipe file and I, I save a lot of design inspiration and some of the original images that I was saving. I'm like, that looks horrible. Why would I save that? Like, why would I even find that inspiring? So I don't know. I think, I think if I would have, I think there's a version of myself that probably went more of the CS route rather than the design route actually, because I do like, getting nerdy and technical. I like systems. And I think in some ways it's easier for me to gravitate towards that side of the discipline rather than like the pure visual side. Graphic design terrifies me. <laughs> like it terrifies me. I need some rules. I need constraints. I need a product interface. Like you give me a square in Figma and it's just like make some kind of a really engaging graphic for X. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like what? do I do here? You know, it's, there's less of a defined playground for me to design in. And so I don't know, maybe not. So now when you're teaching, um, so I've checked out uh, like a handful, I, I mean, you're always showing up on my feed, but do you now find yourself just like talking to a younger version of yourself? And actually, before you answer that, I remember seeing, uh, in your history, like you did you very early on, it was like brand identity and then research before that before that whole like like product designer uh term actually like came into being can you just talk a little about like how research has played into your design ethos yeah so the where the place you would see the word research would probably go back to that like college role where I was telling you where I was working for this company called Eroder and it was basically um it was like anonymous case. so anonymous campus-based social media, like really, really popular for a little bit. And then now it obviously went to zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did research because I brought a V1 to campus and it like took off. Like we led the nation in, in daily active users and the app sucked ass and I needed to like kind of fix it basically. And so that was when I kind of just volunteered and I was like, Hey, let me on the team. Like, I don't want to just be like a brand rep. Like, let me on the team. I'll do design. I'll talk to people. And I started just like jumping on to, um, Skype calls back in the day with different users across the nation, which is college students. So that was like my, that was like the foray that got me into it. I would say where I actually got into to research was doing sales. Like yep. I was for four or five years every day oscillating between selling a product and designing it. And that's a really powerful superpower that not enough designers get to experience because you hear firsthand what are the pain points, but also what value propositions resonate with people, what gets someone's eyes to light up. And so I wouldn't even have called it research back then, actually. It was just growing the business, but you learn so much and I was selling directly to like e-commerce founders who had like small businesses and, you know, I text a lot of them even just, you know, send them little pictures of a mock-up. What about this? What about this? And that's where I actually started to learn some of those skills and understand the importance of it, even though I probably didn't know user research was a formal discipline at that point. And I think well, like, yeah, what you're saying is something that I've also noticed in the last like year or two as, as we're talking so much more with like just founders and just designers um, that there's all the dictums of like how to find product market fit for your startup. 
when they're cast in foundries, it's go talk to your customers, right? And the reason you do that is to go find product market fit. And then when it's cast in designeries, it's like, go do user research. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but the it's the same thing. thing. It's the same, it's exact the same thing. thing, right? Totally. And like, there's something about the vocabulary that like when it gets cast in foundries, it feels a lot more approachable and a lot less like arcane. It's just like, go talk to them. Try to separate them from their money. Like, <laughs> you know, are you able to? Like, why is it that they don't care about what it is that you have to offer? And like what you described of like that loop of like, okay, you go, you do the pitch. And then you go back to sort of the studio and you're like, okay, I know what lit their eyes up and I know what caused their eyes to glaze over. Right. Um, and I think that, yeah, at its core, like sales is very naturally research. Like it's, totally. it's almost like, it's almost like designers, uh, it's almost like product designers are just naturally founders, but the only reason they've been bucketed into a designer role is because they're really, really good at visuals which like typically CEOs are not. And um, they're too kind <laughs> to start up a business and maybe like engage in the game of capitalism. Yeah. It's unfortunate because it's like even completing the loop, like you said, sales is research. I think also designers would benefit so much from being more responsible for figuring out the go-to-market for the features that they design. Yes. Like that's a superpower too. It's Actually, how do we package this work that you've just done for the last month or two? What are the very specific words that we're going to use? What are the very specific visuals that we're going to use to put it out in front of people? Where are they going to find this? Like that is a really interesting exercise in truly understanding your users. It's not just the research, but shipping the thing and then announcing the thing. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why it's really fun to like sort of work um, in and around startups is that because they're so much earlier on in their org charts, things haven't calcified yet. Right. Um, and this produces two very interesting like uh, properties. The first is that you see more of these things where it's like one person can run the entire gauntlet end to end. And they're going from like, you know, asking for the cash on the discovery call down to naming the Figma layers, right? Um, which is like sick. <laughs> and then the second thing is that the startups are also like always at the forefront and they're constantly like, whatever they're doing now is what like the publicly traded companies are gonna be doing like 10, 15 years mm -hmm. from now. And sometimes I feel like what you see of how like the responsibilities get split up at like larger companies, you know, uh, it feels a lot more often the case that it's like the designer is responsible for the visuals and the UI and, and like the pixels, but they're not actually bringing it all the way home of like, what's the micro copy going to be? Or like, you know, uh, how are we going to make this resonate? And I feel like it produces a product where you can kind of tell. Actually, you, you know you, what I mean? You're like, bringing up a good point because we were talking to, uh, to Daria from Shader. Um, either it was like uh, three or four weeks ago and, she was bringing up like really good points around just not having to wait for anyone to make changes yeah. within her product. And mm -hmm. that is, that is a superpower just showed just short of like being able to code, but being able to design, being able to talk to prospective customers, current customers, churned customers, and being able to hear like, okay, this resonates with me, or this is why I stick with your product, or these are my reservations, or this is why I dropped you all. And then being able to go do something about it. And especially now in like this no code world that we're beginning to come up in, I feel like it's being, it's like getting extra pronounced. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I don't know, Rid, like, what do you, what do you think of like, uh, how that could happen in like a larger organizational setting? Cause I feel like some of like what you're describing of like the designers not being involved in go to market, like. Is it something that just would take an org chart reimagination to get them there? Or is it just inevitable that as you get bigger, these functions get like carved up into, you know, narrower and narrower lanes? <laughs> I mean, I think part of it probably is inevitable. And I don't have experience to draw on from this for this answer. And partly is because I I'm a little bit afraid of not having the ability to just yeah. do it, you know? Um, there's something that Brian Lovin from Campsite said to me recently that has kind of just had a space in my brain over the last few weeks, which is 
how at any type of company, you always have the ability to round up like an engineer or two and go on a secret mission together where you just chip away at something behind the scenes. And it's almost creates this like us against the organization mentality that can birth a little bit of camaraderie and actually move projects that would be almost impossible to get by on, buy in on otherwise. So I think there's like, I think people mostly want to just play it safe and exist within the confines of their role and responsibilities. And you can always break out of that in any size organization. That being said, I'm sure there are a lot of limitations that frankly, I just don't understand because I haven't, you know, spent years at Meta. You know, but but like breaking out into like a skunk works tribe within a company, I totally agree with that. Um, but sometimes it can actually like just drive a wedge in between like those two PMs that are fighting for resources. Do you think that um, there's like a more natural way to go about keeping that spirit alive of like, we're constantly readapting, we're constantly, you know, testing new things out and not playing it safe? Um, I might need you to ask that question a little bit differently. It's like, the idea of like sequestering off a couple engineers and a designer and like a PM to go handle something that sometimes I've seen it. I've actually been a part of the skunk works team that has driven the way <laughs> like, you know, I'm asking. And I just remember looking back at that and thinking to myself, I wonder if there's a different way to go about that. But at the same time, I think it's the, the atmosphere of, kind of being sequestered off to go handle a problem is what made made it so special and actually drove it home. And what I'm asking, I guess, is like, is there a way to create that same spirit, that same environment where you don't have an organization that is just constantly getting more and more comfortable with itself? Again, I mean, I kind of have to wrap this in the context of like, man, I've only... I've only worked in the organizations where it's celebrated, I guess, to yeah, just, just freaking do it. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to framing too. Like maybe it's, maybe you aren't actually just going rogue, but you are investing a little bit of time into what you think needs to happen that no one else is doing, but framing it in a way where it's like not super serious or not something that um, feels fully baked and like, we should do this. You know, they're like, wouldn't it be crazy if X, you know, like that, or using the phrase like, something like this what if we did something like this i i use the phrase something like this so much where it basically gives you this this wrapper to to put what you really want to do in but it's like almost deflects preemptively all of the like you know poking holes you know because it's just like this higher please look at this a little bit higher level what if we did something in this general direction or does this feel directionally correct is another piece of language that i would find myself using a lot yeah, I don't know if that exactly that's answers a good the question. Engineering. Directionally correct is that's how you get the PR closed without, you know, the, the code changes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is directionally correct, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it looks good to me, right? Like, so, <laughs> yeah, that language is an interesting part in that. And framing is something that this has come up a few times with founders that we've talked to, where, like, oftentimes, like, when Numi's coming into the picture, it can be in some cases in more resource organizations, they already have like designers in play. Um, and it's not the designer who's making the call to do it. Um, but it's like some decision that the leader is making that uh, something about the resources that they have on the team to solve a problem and the stuff that they need to get done, there's like a mismatch, right? And oftentimes like the solution, selling the solution internally requires like framing, language, letting people know like, Hey, like, like getting the other designers to buy in. Yeah. Getting their buy-in of course. But I always, and you probably hear this as well, but like, it's always, uh, the reason for hiring is either like one of two things, like an outside, uh, you know, um, you know, some type of outside design lift is like, we don't have the time with our current team or we need fresh eyes. 
And nine times out of 10, it actually always turns out to be like the, we need fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what I was just saying, which is like, is there that natural way of like, one, why do designers typically, uh, actually like all these roles, they typically just like play it safe, you know? And then the company gets up to a certain scale or maybe like a certain milestone. And it's like imperative that you have to get your tasks done for that day. You have to do your daily routine, your daily rituals, and then you never actually end up really working on the thing that is going to move the needle. But it sounds like you were able to see the whole thing from start to finish, but you were also in a very privileged position where it was only startups, you know? So I know you can't speak to it, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on like, how is it that someone could almost develop like an allergic reaction to staying comfortable <laughs> within their role? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the fresh eyes point is interesting because I think staying comfortable a lot of times looks like not getting fresh eyes. And we all know as designers, like we're not supposed to get too narrow too quickly. Like we're supposed to keep everything on the table and not be precious about this concept or this direction. And yet we still do it. Like we still do it. And Every time I thought I wasn't doing that, but then I brought in another designer and we're like, hey, can you want to just like talk about this for 15 minutes on Zoom and just like, let me walk you through my current thinking. You very quickly realize based off of some of the initial knee jerk questions, like, well, what have you considered doing this? What about this? What about this? And you start realizing like, oh, I was playing in way too small of a ballpark, even though I thought that I wasn't. And maybe I even took pride on the fact that like, no, 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 like I'm, I'm keeping everything on the table. Like I'm not married to any of my ideas. So like we still operate that way as designers. And so I think, I think the opposite of playing it safe is oversharing a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Oversharing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell, tell us more? Yeah. Can you, share? Can you please overshare? I think in a, I think again, like all of this is kind of through the lens of the startup, but I would imagine it's probably quite applicable to all size companies, but like, you know how you have certain ideas that you really believe in and certain directions that the product could go where you're like, I have conviction that this is the right way. And you almost don't want to mess it up the first time you introduce the idea, right? Because you know, like that initial reaction is like, could determine whether or not people are excited for you to keep thinking about this, or it could just get shut down. And I'm guilty of that. And so what I can think of very specific times of me doing is like, I'm going to make sure I nail this. I'm going to make sure that I have like the, the, the presentation and like really think through this fig jam file where I'm going to walk people through all of the context and the why, and I'm not going to put any eyes on it until I can give a very well constructed six minute loom on why we should do this idea. And that's almost always too late in the process because I will have missed something or I will have, again, like narrowed in too quickly or something like that. And something that, again, is one of those ideas that's kind of been buzzing in my head is, is you know, like the, the, the startup adage where it's like, if, you, uh, if you're not embarrassed by your, your MVP, then you waited too long to ship. Yeah. We know and I think well. a little bit, yeah, I, I <laughs> think that's kind of true for design too, where it's like, if you... I think this is something that Brian said to me too, which is like, if you are, if you're not in, in, if you're not uncomfortable sharing your work, then you probably have, have waited too long and pursued polish over looping people in. And again, that's like, it doesn't feel safe. You don't feel as confident in your ideas as you potentially could be. But again, we know that, well, if the quicker that we loop in, even that just that one other designer oh. it's not like you have to drop something into general on slack but like get somebody looped in yeah i think that's probably my answer i mean i feel like craigslist embodies this yeah they're constantly embarrassed oh yeah yeah, yeah. no they, <laughs> they are just printing a billion embarrassing dollars of advertising revenue <laughs> off of blue text and they share it early yeah like very very early well i also i wanted to get into this like uh I want to hear from you like a little bit more on this tweet that you put out. I think it must've been like a little over like a week ago that you were like something like two years ago, I was completely anonymous 
you know, <laughs> and I just committed every day to waking up at 5 a.m. and and honing my craft or or doing a little bit of shift nudge, like, and I was able to build momentum. And then that led you eventually right to to ending up on um, Maven's radar, right? Like, I'd love to hear the story from like you making this conscious decision to, you know, being Maven's founding designer. Like, what was that? Yeah, so the conscious decision was to wake up every day and work on Figma Academy, which was in one part just making things and trying to discover the different like systems and rules of thumbs and how to teach them. But also it was like sharing what I was learning as a way to build distribution for what I would inevitably ship because I knew that was going to be important. And so that was like the six month period. But what was happening really is I was getting deeper and deeper into this like rabbit hole of online learning. And the deeper that I got down that rabbit hole, the more that I started to kind of wonder how actually would I build the course that I want? And I started to realize it's not that easy. And it actually involves like a lot of Zapier duct tape. And so yep. then I was having this, realization where it's like, man, I want to keep doing my own course, but also I'm starting to become aware that the bigger opportunity has nothing to do with my individual course. It's more at the infrastructure level. And I fully believed that someone was going to build something here because I couldn't find it. And I thought, man, if I can't find it, then nobody can find it because I am like really obsessing over this problem space. And so I decided at that point that I was going to quit my job if I could find someone else who was working on this because I didn't want to start up by myself again. I didn't think that I had that in me. And I started like talking to people. Um, even like I, there was a couple companies that I pinged that I thought maybe would be working on something like this in the future. And they didn't even have job opportunities. And I was just like, here's all the reasons you should hire me to work on this problem set. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that didn't work as you can imagine. But then I heard, uh, Guggen Biani, who was one of the co-founders of Udemy, I heard him talking on a podcast and he was describing this new startup that didn't even have a name yet. And it was exactly the problem set that I was wanting to work on. And so as soon as the plane landed, I was on an airplane while listening and I you know, got out my phone and I just whipped up a quick email. And same thing. Like, here's, here's why yeah. you should hire me eventually. And, um, and it worked. They let me in. So I joined as employee three, but it was kind of cool because I I sought out the problem space more than the company and it ended up working. So how do you identify these days as like an educator or a designer? Option C, confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I don't want to identify as an educator. And I don't really know why, because I think that we should look up to educators, but I, I, I don't know. It feels like, you know, it's like the, 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 the school of rock quote where he's like, those who can't do teach. Exactly. I think I live yeah. in perpetual fear of that quote. Maybe it's just like burned somewhere <laughs> in my brain where I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. And so I almost identify a little bit more with founder maybe mm -hmm. totally but i'm trying to do everything i'm trying to do everything and, and i'm trying to continue to push my craft as a designer because it is something that i care about like i want to so, i want to be so a like fringe. yeah totally and like in the spirit of doing everything like what was it like working um on maven while you yourself right were were you while at Maven also actively using the Maven product, both as a, a course taker, a learner and an instructor or. No, it was not even close. I mean, when I, when I started, when I started at Maven, it was not really a product. Um, it, it, interestingly enough, it was a business before it was a product. Like Maven was making money and had high profile customers before any product existed because we were functioning as essentially like a, a high end agency with a little bit of tech enablement. And behind the scenes, we were just racing to so, build out the product. <laughs> yeah, you might yeah. resonate yeah. a little That's bit with where that. we are right now. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah, okay. 
so it wasn't anywhere but, so, really yeah. close where I could use it. And so, so like you said, you recently migrated or like got your course stood up on Maven. So were you guys just doing things that don't scale behind the scenes, like, and just productizing your learnings or like, what was that process like? We got to the point where I would say we had a solid V1 after, I don't know, six to eight months, probably where there were a lot of edge cases that we couldn't account for, but like it worked. We were still reliant on one third party CMS for one syllabus part of the product, but like it, it was a software product and it did work. There wasn't a flippening until after a year where I remember we would obsess over the essentially like the NPS scores, but it was separate out between our educational offering and, or kind of like the, like the, the coaching, the people part of the business and the actual product. And that was when the switch was flipped where it's like, okay, actually people are here for the product. and. That definitely took a solid year. And so it was nowhere near where I would move my stuff there. And also at the same time, which was like kind of crazy, my course was just growing so much more quickly than I thought was possible. And so I kind of was like, I can't touch this because I don't want to break it. Yeah, and yeah. so it took a solid two years. And, and actually a big part of like, something that I was really pushing for in the product was making it less reliant on like live sessions and more equipped to handle these mixed method courses where you could have like a really robust async syllabus and live experiences joined into one. It took me about two years to get that vision to really like, yeah, for us to put, you know, resources behind that. And once we yeah. did, then I, I moved over. Wait, so, okay, I, you, you mentioned something that I, I didn't realize that there were two separate kind of offerings that Maven was offering, like one on what you said, the human side of the business and then the product side, what yeah. was the human side? So Maven has a course taught on Maven that teaches people how to teach. It's like super meta and that. Yeah is simply the best resource on the entire internet for anyone who wants to teach a course. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And so people were going through this program and then we would kind of use it as onboarding even. Like it, it allowed us, because the product wasn't self-serve even. Like you had to go through this program in order to get access to the product. And that was our way of kind of like, honestly, just like slowly ramping up and making sure that we were getting a lot of like feedback and tight iteration loops and things like that. So people loved that course. They loved the coaching program. And then they would get to the product and they'd be like, this is so MVP. It hurts. You know, <laughs> it was like that for a little bit. So how'd you bridge, how'd you bridge that gap? Uh, bridge the gap in terms of like keep the in terms of like what what people were loving yeah like what people were loving about you know the course and then you just like airdrop them into the product and they're like eh. i that's a good question i think we did benefit a lot from the fact that we had really good relationships with our early users like and a lot of that comes from kind of having celebrity founders too where their right. network comprised a large chunk of the initial user base or like friend of a friend kind of thing where, and also it was like a really hot seed round and series A where yeah. they strategically took investments from all these high profile people. And so some of the instructors were also incentivized as investors as well, where it's like people weren't just going to like churn and ghost for the most part. Ultimately, we were able to bridge the gap with a lot of just behind the scenes manual effort to make things work on people's behalf. But we also kind of learned during that season that we wanted to switch the, the target persona anyway. 
And oh. we weren't going to be like this creator economy company who was monetizing, helping people with really large audiences monetize. And instead, we wanted to find like the people that really, really understood what they were doing. And maybe there's some IC at a well-known company. How can you help them teach even if they don't have existing distribution? That switch happened. And it ultimately kind of baked in this like reset point a little bit, which made it kind of easy where frankly, we didn't care about the churn from anyone in that early phase because we realized that's not where the, the business is going to be able to see like the sustainable growth and, and have this type of ceiling that we wanted. Was there a process to arriving at that insight that you wanted to focus on that customer persona? Yes. It's a robust answer that largely is broken up into two parts. One is you're just talking to all the people that are originally on the platform. And the more you get to know the creator type, the more you realize Maven would always be one part of a larger portfolio of monetization pieces. And you're never going to be the number one thing. And so, and that's what we saw a lot of people just simply not have success. We, we realized like audience does not necessarily correlate as strongly to monetization as we thought. The other part was something that we were talking about from day zero, which is should Maven be a marketplace? What is Maven's consumer facing brand? Is it going to be a platform where we only empower educators and don't think about distribution from like Maven? Or are we going to have some kind of essentially like our version of Udemy? And I think it was always a when, not if, but it was fiercely debated on a number of occasions in the early days. And the idea of switching personas to more of these like industry experts who maybe don't have distribution necessitated a marketplace move because we had to move the needle right. to get them in front of people. And so there were a lot of different things that were happening that made it feel like, yeah, that is, that's the direction that we need to go in. And so there was a pretty big swing that was made after, gosh, I guess it had been like a year and a half where we made that switch. And yeah, it ended up, it ended up working out. I think it was probably inevitable too. I think, I don't think that we necessarily made a mistake and went after the wrong persona. I think it was just, we went after the right persona to get the ball rolling and get momentum. Yep. And then we switched to the, the, you know, the, 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 the longer uh, growth curve basically. How'd you, how'd you nurture that change that I would imagine that like a lot of people inside Maven were like, no, that's too risky. I feel like there's just like this large theme right now of like playing it safe and like what, what, what did those conversations look like? Or did you just let like the data do the talking and you're like, Hey, just have these customer interviews, just did this uh, swath of research, just showed this like prototype. Seems like there's a lot of like good, good feedback coming in or was it something more? I mean, the data didn't do the talking really. <laughs> I mean, they're like, yeah. there was some, <laughs> there was some churn data, but the thing about Maven that's so crazy is like the feedback loops can be really slow because we're not shipping a SaaS product that everyone's using every day. You're doing this thing where an educator might run a cohort once a quarter, maybe less even. And so you got to make bets that are just not really going to be 100% supported in the data and kind of go with intuition. And so it was a lot of discussion. Um, and ultimately, I think that we knew that the business line, like the bottom line, was going to take a hit. It's going to take a hit with the, with the shift. And it was a lot of preparing people for that, but also building conviction that like this is the, the direction that we want to go. And I think, to... yeah. Yeah. I was just about to ask like, yeah, how did you build that conviction? I think a lot of it was because 
we as an operations team were experiencing the pain of the previous business model where the marginal cost from an operation standpoint for each new instructor was very high when we were in this creator focused mode because you are you're again you're kind of functioning at this in between between like a product and a tech empowered agency where some of these users and by users i mean like you know the instructors the the the, the twitter profiles with 100,000 followers man they just required a lot of support like a lot of support and we're doing a lot of the work on their behalf and it wasn't necessarily tied to um we're doing way more work than taking a 10% cut justified basically oh, yeah and so you start to feel this thing where it's like whoa this side of the team even is growing really quickly and you can feel some of these scaling pains more acutely as we start adding it on. And so I, I think some of the, the um, buy-in internally came from like, let's make all of these hurts go away in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's actually like one of the places where you can most vividly see you know, um, like something that you, the team may not want to be doing right terminally is like okay wow we're doing it this way and uh the more we grow the more we have to hire for this function that like we didn't envision this turning into like a company where most of the headcount is like in this flavor of ops right mm -hmm. and you're like okay is that what we want to become and then that kind of leads to another round of questions another round of questions and next thing you know yeah you probably have like that core insight right and what's funny is like the ops ended up just changing like it always does because then you realize, huh. well, shoot, we're bringing on a bunch of industry experts and maybe this designer has been leading teams for 15 years. But you know what they haven't been doing for 15 years? Selling a digital product and building an audience. They have no idea how to market, you know? And so now all of a sudden it puts pressure on different parts of the product and different parts of the offers where we were, man, there were some really fun, really fun discussions that we're trying to figure out some of the higher level product strategy decisions and just how opinionated of a product we wanted to be too. I think Maven's actually quite an opinionated product in a way that I was like kind of one of the main proponents for like, we should have a, we should, this is the way, like this is the way. And a lot of that came from the- yeah, like, yeah. What makes an opinionated product or an opinionated company? Yeah. so. Um, I think the opposite of, and the opinionated version of Maven would be this like collection of open-ended tools. And instead we have a model for what we think it looks like to not only build a course experience, but also how to build a course business and how you should think about marketing, the timelines you should think about marketing, the, the higher level mental models that you should be using to like evaluate your own personal funnel. And those are reflected quite strongly in the product. Um, even the landing page, uh, we do not have an open-ended landing page builder where you can just do anything with it. But instructors love our landing page builder. It is like, I've never had any negative feedback about it. Like it's just, it's always been like a smash hit. And the reason I think is because we basically said, Hey, this is what is included in a really good landing page. Here's how you should think about the order. Here's a bunch of default copy to help you think about what should go in it. Now just make it your own. And that, that methodology is backed up in a lot of the product where we were specifically limiting pieces of email functionality. And, and again, like I was kind of, I had a cheat code, right? Because I was doing this with my own course while oh. I'm designing Maven and I'm experiencing all of the problems firsthand. And so I'm, I was able to look at something like ConvertKit, which is like this open-ended email marketing platform. You can do anything with ConvertKit. And I'm able to see, actually, I really just want to do this 15% really easily. And if we could do it this way, we could just automate all of it. And we put really, really tight guardrails on what, 
email marketing even looks like for a course business. But if we do it this way and we come in really opinionated, then we can compete in a way where other products mm -hmm. can't because they have to account for many, many, many more use cases. And so that was kind of always our lens. Like how can we, how can we put in tighter guardrails, which allow us to tailor our offering to something that is like, we would use the phrase CBC native a lot, cohort based course native. And yeah. if something is CBC native, then a more broad or a more broadly applicable platform can't compete with it. No, that's, that's a, oh my gosh. Yeah. What you're describing is almost like a, a process oriented product rather than a function oriented product exactly. where like a function is like convert kits. Like, okay, we're going to own the email marketing space. Now I know that like their, their origin story was around like people with like prominent blogs and stuff, right. Is the yeah. sort of part of their concentric circles. Right. Whereas like for you guys, you're like, no, we believe cohort based courses are the way to do a course on the internet. And we're just going to build the best platform for doing things that way. I feel like Fiverr, Upwork, HubSpot, unopinionated. Yeah. Apple, yeah. Airbnb, Palms, opinionated. Yeah. You know, it's like, we have a purpose. This is actually what we believe in these, in, in these themes of our company. And like, if you're not a subscriber, no worries. There's plenty of other newsletters. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, it kind of even connects back to the idea that we were talking about earlier with the thinking about the go to market. Like I remember yeah. we made a big play in email and we created this opinionated product. And then as soon as it was ready, we literally had a webinar where I was able to lead the webinar to teach instructors how they should think about a marketing funnel as it relates to email and like what that journey looked like. And we weren't even teaching them how to use the product. Like we were teaching them marketing. We were teaching them a marketing methodology that was then backed up with the product. It's kind of fun. And the designer is going to teach it because the designer is also an instructor. Yeah. Like, nice yeah. Weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Do you guys have any, any thoughts that you wanted to bring up that we haven't gotten to yet? Well, I just, I, I more so have like a uh, commentary and then just such like a, 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 a dumb, like, you know, um, prototypical question, which is like, I bet a lot of designers looking at this right now or watching this right now are like, holy shit, what a guy to look up to. Because went like literally went from, um, you know, studying economics, going into like, like the Wall Street space being like, I don't know about this and then hard pivot to the design world. I've always felt that like the spookiest uh, that's my terminology for like the most gifted designers are always the ones that are self-taught. Like they just see things with a, uh, like a brand new lens. Do you have, here's the first question. Do you have any advice for those types of designers or like the design curious people that are thinking about getting into the discipline and on the flip side, founders? Yeah. I think my answer is two parts because I don't want to give the prototypical answer, which I do think is, it's so important. Just set a timer for two hours as often as you can and just create something new from scratch and apply some visual principle or copy some piece of software that you really like, like invest early and often in your visual skills. I think that's like the obvious answer that I'm going to state quickly because I do think it's very important. Building on top of that, though, I think so much of good design is working backwards from having an opinionated take on some set of problems that you care way more than most people about. And I think a lot of that even could be you just writing. Like, you don't even have to sketch. Some people sketch. Great. I don't sketch. I write. And... I think if you really, really pick a problem space and go just super deep on it, ideally it's a place that you want to work or like kind of like, you know, you did the unsolicited redesign of Imgur and, oh, sure. you, know, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff is like, that's so, that's so impactful. But I think that, um, a lot of times the case studies that I see are, are just like really, you know, kind of surface level and it's quite clear they just picked like a popular Absolutely. product. Yeah. Travel app. Yeah, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, Stacy wants to add two numbers together. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'll always push I'll always push designers to have more of a business hat on, I guess. Yeah. And like, you know, man, what would be so compelling for me to see is to have a case study that starts off by your informed hypothesis about a specific industry and like competitive landscape analysis and where you think these companies are headed and why and where the market opportunity is based off of these different trajectories and then what it looks like to capitalize on that market opportunity. I never see case studies like that. I, I would be so compelled by something like that. Yeah, you're so right. And I mean, like, yeah, like closing that out too is just like, I, I see so many case studies, which I, I get, I think this is a, like a lot more common with folks that are maybe early career and they just want to show like how faithful they are to the form, right? But they'll have like a really lengthy case study where you can actually tell that it feels very much like they're um, diligently going through the motions as if it's an academic exercise trying to be like here's how you create user personas they took the table of yeah. contents from check like box. Idea of check box. Yes. and they're like oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah here's right. the problem here's the solution right. here's the flow here right, are the right. wires here's the prototype yeah mm. here's the final mocks here's what I store five out of five stars. And it's like, it's like no <laughs> knock. I mean, they're, they're almost like they're, they're taking the anti-writ approach, right? Of actualizing as a designer of like very much academic classwork like type approach. But I think you're right that the most compelling stuff is not like um, sticky notes on a wall. It's like group chat screenshots. Go talk to your fucking customers. Right? Yeah, go, yeah. Go use your own product as them. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> figure out ways to have that conversation be natural. Not like, email to my calendar link so that let's spend 15 minutes and we do no no no. it's like let me actually like set up an iv drip so that like i'm getting feedback from you on my lock screen naturally until i have to tell you the customer stop okay like i like i got it i understood you know whatever um it, it's very different um and i think that yeah you're right like people who think at that deeper level like it just shines through when they're talking about their work yeah and like Try to ship something too. Like just the amount that you learn from designing something and actually putting it onto the internet to see how it is received. And it can be so small. It doesn't have to have any code. But even just thinking about how you're going to like visualize and announce what you've done is such an amazing exercise that no one is stopping you from doing. And it's so beneficial, you know, regardless of whether you're a designer or a founder. I think the lines between those two things should be blurred, especially for this kind of an exercise. And yeah, I just, I so strongly believe that everyone should have at least one personal launch day under their belt. And that launch day is probably going to be more powerful than the case study you have on your website anyway, when you're looking for your next role. Brewer words have not been spoken. Rid, thank you so much, man. Thank you. This has been really fun. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks. See you.